Hello and uh, thanks for being here with us today. Um, I'm Stéphane Le Simple, I'm working for VH Cloud and I will be co-presenting with Agatha Gruva from Intel. Um, before getting started, um, a few words about myself. Um, I joined OVH Cloud 10 years ago. I did a few um, different things during that time and I'm currently part of the uh, security team there. So today we're going to talk about um, a little side project of mine uh, started early 2018 um, named Spectre and Meltdown Checker. So um, a quick summary of, uh, of what we're going to cover um, in this presentation. So first I'm going to talk about um, security vulnerabilities and what changed when uh, Spectre and Meltdown came out. Then of course how to fix uh, them. Um, then we'll talk about the script itself um, and um, show you how it can help you um, and showing you secure. We'll talk about a few governing principles I have, um, developing the scripts and of course I will uh, do a short demo. Then I will uh, leave the mic to Agatha who will be talking about her experience working with a script, uh, contributing to it, namely adding new vulnerabilities to check for. Um, and some explanation about what to expect from the script and uh, what not to expect from it, which is also, of course, um, very important. So let's go. The first um, class of security bugs uh, I'd like to talk about are uh, implementation flows. So this is really the most um, common category of security bugs, and those are um, a flow in the code written by the developer. Um, so you have a lot of um, categories uh, you probably already heard about, such as uh, buffer overflows, um, insufficient even checking, which can then lead to uh, some uh, different problems, such as uh, shell injection and control program behavior, etc. Then you have all the uh, RAS conditions um, kind of bugs um, with uh, their own subcategories, etc. This is not exhaustive at all, it's just to, to, to show you that uh, those kind of bugs are extremely common and there are dozens and dozens uh, new bugs um, every day in this category. Um, in that case, who is impacted? Well, it's somewhat limited because um, it's everybody using a specific version of a specific software. Um, I took an example here um, uh, in OpenSSL. Um, a CVU that is uh, four years ago, and in that case it was a bug in the DTLS implementation um, in OpenSSL between version 1.1.0 and 1.1.0a, which is, as you can see, pretty specific. Um, and what's important to understand here is that other implementations of DTLS were not impacted, so for example GNU TLS um, was not impacted. How can you fix uh, those kind of bugs? Well, it's pretty easy. You uh, patch the uh, problematic um, code um, and then you release a new version of, and of course you tell your uh, users to update uh, the software. Um, I took the example of the portion of code uh, that was written to actually patch uh, the vulnerability I'm talking about and as you can see, it's uh, fairly easy. It was just a missing check uh, in an if block. So uh, those kind of flows are pretty common but also uh, pretty easy to fix. Then you have uh, the design flows. Um, in that case, it's still somewhat common, um, but it's a flow in the concept uh, the code is implementing and not in the code itself, which means that um, as a developer, if your code is completely flawless, perfect, you've done all your tests and, and everything, um, yeah, it's very cool, but you're still vulnerable because the problem is in the concept you've been implementing, not in the code uh, itself. So in that case, uh, the impact is a bit broader, of course, because um, uh, anybody using a software that implements uh, this concept um, is potentially impacted. Um, I've took uh, another example in the TLS world, um, which uh, is the beast uh, attack. And um, all the um, TLS 1.0 um, implementations were available because the problem was in the specification. And uh, so, of course, what's important to understand is that uh, OpenSSL was vulnerable, GNU TLS was vulnerable, and uh, all software using those libraries was also, of course, vulnerable. So, to fix those kind of bugs, you uh, publish a new version of the concept, a new RFC. Uh, here we have TLS 1.1 and then wait for all the uh, developers to implement the new concept in their software and hopefully we can hope that the old version of the concept will be phased out rapidly. The thing is that uh, as of today, um, almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, 10 years after um, the BSTLS attack uh, went out, we still have one third of the web servers that are still accepting uh, TLS 1.0, so those servers are still vulnerable to the beast attacks. So as you can see, it's a bit more complicated than um, just patching code and uh, releasing a new version of your software. 
Then of course you have the um, third and last category um, of hardware of flows. Sorry, the hardware flows. So um, before 2018, uh, most of the people thought that those kind of um, flows, um, exploiting them, required physical access to the chip. For example, by um, playing with it, uh, undervolting it, overvolting it, and uh, seeing how it can react. Uh, of course, this is only possible in very controlled environments, such as um, R&D, R&D lab. Um, and so even if the um, proof of concept are still interesting, most of the people, uh, and not to say everybody thought that um, it was impossible to explode really in the wild. So even if it was interesting, it was not really a, a big threat uh, to, you know, real life. Um, yeah, and then uh, 2018 happened. And uh, the world collapsed, you know. Um, actually, the security community understood that um, it was actually possible to exploit those in the wild and um, in a way easier manner than uh, what was previously thought. So in that case, uh, who is impacted? Um, well, pretty much everything, all software, including the operating system itself, because the operating system is just some other kind of software, uh, as long as it's running on the uh, vulnerable hardware. I've put a few examples there. Of course, Spectre Meltdown was the first, but then uh, as everybody understood that it was possible, uh, then uh, a lot of research uh, was made. And of course, uh, sure enough, new vulnerabilities were found with cool names because uh, vulnerabilities have to have cool names now. Of course, so we had uh, Foreshadow, Fallout, Zombie Load, uh, you name it. Um, how can you fix that? Well, of course you can uh, buy new hardware and hope that the new hardware doesn't have the flow. Uh, but you can't always do that, and um, if you don't want to do that, well, the answer is complicated. Let's see in more details. First, you have the um, CPU microcode. You can see that as um, the uh, firmware of your CPU, because nowadays, of course, uh, as you know, CPUs are no longer just a bunch of transistors uh, and uh, logic gates. Uh, this is more, way more complicated with a lot of uh, complex blocks working together. And the microcode is here to uh, ensure everything it works correctly and it can be updated. Um, this microcode might uh, expose new features, um, new switches, new knobs that uh, can be used by the OS kernel to mitigate uh, a vulnerability because of course you can't patch the vulnerability, you can just mitigate it. Uh, so the uh, kernel also needs to be updated to be able to use the new microcode features. If you're running in a virtualized environment, uh, you might also have to update um, the hypervisor because uh, the hypervisor is responsible uh, for um, um, uh, showing also um, features to the uh, VMOS kernel, which also needs to be updated um, because it might also it might be the same uh, kernel than the host, but it's still a new instance of a kernel that might need to fiddle with um, what is exposed by the microcode and um, path through through the hypervisor, so that's why all uh, those layers have to be updated and uh, have to know um, the new microcode features to be able to correctly mitigate uh, uh, the vulnerabilities. Uh, also in some cases, uh, for example on Spectre Variant 1, you might have to update um, other software such as your Firefox, your Bash, your Xi's, you name it, uh, because for some uh, kind of vulnerabilities, um, you have to have a new a new version of the compiler and recompile the, the software to ensure that uh, this doesn't produce um, the uh, bad order of opcode that make the vulnerability more easier to exploit. So as you can see, in the worst case, you might have to update five different layers of your system just to mitigate one vulnerability. So it's, it's really complicated. So now let's talk about um, the D-Day. Um, a few days before, um, they were starting to uh, have clues everywhere. For example, um, KPTI uh, was merged on the last day of the year, which is pretty odd, um, in the Linux kernel very, very late in the release cycle of the kernel. Um, usually a feature as big as KPTI uh, is, will never be merged uh, during a release cycle. It will be merged um, at the beginning of the merge window and then the release, can the release candidates uh, releases are here to uh, ensure that uh, it's stable enough to be released. So uh, merging so big a patch um, 
at RC6, we say this really never happens. Uh, Linus also explicitly asked the maintainers to backport this patch uh, on the other stable uh, kernel versions, which uh, also was pretty hard. Um, another very um, strange thing was that uh, that uh, feature was enabled by default. This never happens. Um, such big features such as KPTI, which is a completely uh, design, design change, it's a design change uh, by um, it usually takes years to be enabled by default because, of course, uh, there are a lot, a lot of different uh, systems out there and um, it has to be thoroughly tested uh, by a lot of people because before um, we are uh, sure enough that it can be enabled by default. So those uh, things were really red flags for the security community. Uh, some people also noticed that uh, Microsoft was working on um, patches similar than KPTI for Windows at, the, at that same time. So at that point, um, we knew that something uh, something big was coming for us, um, and so we were just uh, waiting uh, in fear, you know. And uh, sure enough, um, it happens. Spectral meltdown uh, became public on the third, um, and that's when uh, we thought that okay, um, all systems are potentially vulnerable. Uh, your uh, microwave oven, your uh, fridge, uh, your phone, uh, your computer, of course, everything running, some kind of CPU and some kind of operating system or software might be vulnerable, maybe. Um, it became public a few days or weeks before the um, planned end of the embargo, so the microcode updates were not completely ready for all the uh, CPUs and the kernel patches were still uh, moving a lot. Um, I also noticed at that time um, silent backports from the um, Linux vendor community where uh, some vendors were taking uh, patches from the Linux kernel mailing list. Um, those patches were not stable, they were not yet committed to the uh, vanilla kernel, but still they were uh, integrating uh, those patches to their, uh, to their uh, own kernel, trying to protect their users. Um, and those backports were silent most of the time. So. Um, four days later, um, it's January the 7th, uh, it's a cold snowy Sunday, uh, I'm on my couch, and um, that was a pretty hectic, uh, hectic uh, week. I read a lot of things um, about the vulnerabilities uh, the few days before, and the thing is, the facts were evolving literally every hour, because of course the vulnerabilities were completely new. Completely new. So um, the vendors were taking some time to trying to understand uh, whether um, uh, which model of each CPU uh, was pro probably vulnerable or not, etc. So it was really um, uh, developing every hour and changing every hour. So I thought, okay, as a uh, sysadmin, as a somebody who is uh, managing uh, infrastructures, I just want two simple answers to two simple questions. Is my hardware affected first? And then if the answer is yes, are the mitigation in place uh, on my system? And the uh, answers to those questions were very complicated and evolving all the time. So that's why I wanted to write a script to try to get simple yes-no answers. Um, and of course, the script would evolve uh, every hour if needed. Now, a few um, governing principles I have um, developing the script. Um, first, uh, when information about one vulnerability is not yet completely available, I assert a system to be vulnerable by, by default. Um, this is a legacy from the uh, Spectral and Meltdown um, era, but it's still uh, true today. When a new vulnerability comes out, it's not uh, really clear uh, right now um, which uh, model and which CPU and which vendor is vulnerable or not. So uh, by default, I assert uh, every CPU as vulnerable, and then as um, the information um, comes out, I update the script and say, okay, this model is known to be safe, etc. This way, I'm sure that the script never tells you um, that you're safe when, when actually you're not. I also um, never hardcode kernel or microcode versions in the script, uh, because of course this doesn't work with backports. And um, I prefer to directly look into the kernel image and um, see deep in it whether uh, mitigations are compiled in. Uh, this, in this way it works with uh, silent backports and it also works if you have um, a kernel image you don't have the source or configuration for, uh, the script will, will be able to tell you. Same thing for microcode, I directly uh, query the uh, different different flags and um, tell you whether it's okay or not for each vulnerability without hard coding some uh, microcode version anywhere. Um, I also don't um, trust what the kernel says too much because you might have an old kernel 
and uh, sometimes on some vulnerabilities uh, things evolve over time and so your kernel might tell you that you're okay where actually um, you're not so uh, the script doesn't uh, trust it too much and has its own logic implemented in uh, I will also never attempt to run exploit our, our proof of concept um, to gather information on your system because for this kind of vulnerabilities uh, proof of concept are really error prone and it will it would uh, create a lot of false positives and false negatives so uh, I don't uh, I don't do that I also never modify the system I'm running on so that you can uh, run the script on your production system uh, without uh, any problem uh, it should also be possible to uh, inspect a kernel without uh, actually running it. You can point the script to an image uh, and it will tell you whether the mitigations are completely or not. I am, I'm also uh, POSIX shell compliant so that uh, I can run on uh, all Linux flavors and uh, BSD also. And of course the uh, fifth layer um, we've seen before, the other software is out of scope. I'm only uh, looking at your CPU, your microcode, your kernel and uh, maybe your hypervisor if you're running the uh, script inside the VM. Okay, so um, now it's demo time. Um, so let's first um, launch the script um, in a hardware only mode. Uh, in that mode, the script um, tells you facts about um, your uh, CPU and microcode. Um, so uh, the first part here is uh, showing uh, a couple of flags uh, that are, uh, this is the switches or knobs I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, you can see that uh, even if I had some, a somewhat old kernel, uh, and also I have a very custom uh, kernel, an old CPU, sorry. Um, I have a fairly recent microcode, so um, you can see that the IBRS and IBPB features are supported by my microcode. So this can be of use to help, uh, or this is one of the ways to uh, mitigate, for example, Spectre Variant uh, 2. Um, so, however, I don't have enhanced IBRS. Um, this is a feature that requires actually um, hardware support uh, of the CPU. Uh, so, of course, I'm not going to patch um, enhanced support on my CPU, enhanced CPU support on my CPU by using my soloing Harun. <laughs> this is a bad idea. Um, so as my CPU was released before at 2018, I just don't have it. Um, then here you have a lot of flags um, for newer CPUs that tell your uh, operating system that they are completely unaffected by uh, some vulnerability. For example, if I take Meltdown here, uh, there is a special flag which is named RDCL No. And if this uh, flag is set, uh, you will see a yes here. And it will tell your system that the CPU is completely unaffected. Uh, this is the case for CPU that were released after a vulnerability. Of course, the design was changed in the CPU so that uh, the vulnerability just no longer uh, exists. So uh, it means that the um, operating system doesn't need to put in place any mitigation for this vulnerability. So as my CPU is old, uh, I have no everywhere here. Um, there is also a special line here um, telling me that my microcode is not known uh, to cause stability problems. Um, I think this is the only place where I did add code some microcode versions because at some point um, there were a batch of microcode that were uh, released that ended up um, being uh, bugged and at after some time, after some days of uptime, your system might freeze or reboot. Uh, so of course they were updated uh, since then, but uh, I've put the version in the script so that if you see a yes here instead of a no, please uh, stop what you're doing and uh, downgrade or upgrade your microcode, but please, uh, please don't keep this one. Then there is a line that tells me whether uh, the microcode I have is the last known version for my uh, CPU model which is the case here. Uh, the script has its own uh, DB of uh, microcode versions and, and we'll tell you more about this uh, after. Then there is the um, portion where uh, there is one line per vulnerability and it tells you whether your CPU is affected by one vulnerability or not, uh, regardless of the mitigation that may be in place um, on your system. So uh, as you can see my, on my CPU, um, uh, I have uh, most of the uh, vulnerabilities except for Shadow SGX because um, my CPU doesn't have SGX extensions, so it's okay. And I'm um, also not affected by Zombie Load Variant 2. So now let's uh, relaunch the script um, with the um, full output. So as you can see, the first part is uh, still the uh, hardware check. Then um, you have one paragraph per uh, CVU, per vulnerability. 
I'm not going, of course, to detail all those lines. We don't have time for that. But um, as you can see, it goes into um, great details in uh, showing you each precondition uh, that has to be met to ensure that at the end, your um, system is not vulnerable, um, either because it's not affected or because it correctly mitigates the vulnerability. And uh, for some uh, kind of vulnerabilities, you can see that several mitigations are possible. So it shows you um, each uh, option. And um, there is a little conclusion at each uh, at the end of each paragraph telling you, okay, uh, you're not vulnerable or you're vulnerable. Um, so as you can see, it's pretty much green. Um, I've disabled one of the mitigations uh, for this demo to show you some uh, red flags. Uh, so I've disabled the MDS uh, class of mitigation on my kernel, then rebooted. And as you can see, uh, the script correctly sees that the kernel I have supports the mitigation, uh, so it's completely uh, compiled in. Uh, also, on the hardware part, I do have the um, where is it? I do have the uh, MD clear bit. I don't see it, but it's there. Yeah, here. Uh, so the microcode is up to date also. But um, the, um, the mitigation is disabled at runtime, so at the end I'm vulnerable, and it tells me that uh, it tells correctly that uh, my microcode and kernel are both up to date, but the mitigation is disabled. Then uh, at the end of the output of the script, you also have a quick summary um, to tell you whether you're okay or not okay for each mitigation. Um, you can also uh, modify the output uh, to get a, a more shorter output, which is easier to parse in your script or monitoring um, systems. As you can see, uh, you can also use JSON, etc. There are a couple of other uh, options um, uh, available. Um, uh, I will let you test. And uh, so I will show you now how to inspect a kernel image, uh, which is different from the uh, kernel that I'm currently running on. So let's uh, point the script to um, a kernel image. Um, so you have to specify the image. If you have it, you can also specify the configuration, but you don't have to if you if it's not available. And you can also specify the map file if it happens to be available on your system. And this is a typo. Okay. Um, so the script runs uh, again, and then um, it's not checking the, the currently running kernel. Uh, it's checking the um, image, I've pointed it um, on the uh, command line. Um, so as you can see, the, uh, the image is uh, somehow somehow hold. Uh, sorry, my cat is uh, <laughs> doing some noise. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so as you can see, this is a fairly old kernel. So um, as you can see, it doesn't have the spectre uh, mitigations in place. Um, and um, same for other mitigations. However, I do have a KPTI, which is what's needed for uh, meltdown. So um, yeah, if you do compile a new kernel, that this can be uh, interesting to, to test. You can also test without um, specifying the configuration of the map file if you don't have those. For example, if it's a kernel um, that you have and uh, you, you didn't compile it yourself, uh, you can't point the script at it. Uh, it will tell you that accuracy might be reduced, but it will still try to do it be its best to tell whether the mitigations are here or not. Um, what you can do also is uh, marking a CPU. That can be uh, interesting um, if you have some a special um, machine that have that has some exotic CPU on your production, for example, and you can't, um, you don't want to uh, directly reboot on a new kernel uh, and check. You might want to uh, mock actually the CPU on some uh, develop machine, development machine. So um, you run the script and then it uh, dumps a bunch of uh, environment variables that you can set. And if you do, then the script will run in um, in a mocking mode. And so it's not looking at the current CPU you have, but it's looking at the uh, mocked CPU you have. Of course, in my case, uh, I've just mocked the same CPU that I have, so the result is the same. Um, some words about the um, database of uh, microcode uh, that is built in into the script. Uh, so the sources are um, the um, MC extractor project on GitHub, which has a lot of uh, microcode versions for a lot of different uh, CPU vendors. And um, it also queries the uh, Intel firmware's GitHub reposit repository, which is uh, quite neat. And uh, so uh, the source of information is, uh, is very good. And so uh, that's how uh, you, it can tell you that your microcode is up to date or not. Um, of course, you can update uh, the, the database yourself. 
Um, okay, that's it for the demo. And so, um, Agatha, the uh, virtual stage is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Welcome, everyone. Hope you are enjoying Open Source Summit so far. Today, I would like to talk about my journey with Spectre and Meltdown Checker and how you can start contributing to that Checker tool. Shortly about me. I work for Intel for over five years as a performance engineer. Currently, I am mainly focusing on investigating performance impact of Linux kernel security patches and Intel microcode. Few notes about disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed here are solely my own and don't represent the views or opinion of Intel or any of its subsidiaries and affiliates. Also, Intel doesn't control the content of the tool and like any open source tool, it might not always be up to date. You should not rely on it as the only way to identify potential vulnerabilities that might affect the system on which it's running. With that in mind, before I go any further, I would like to set the tone and explain terminology I will be using throughout the talk. First, I want to distinguish between kernel and script patch. During this presentation, I will call kernel patch as a kernel update and script patch, I will just call it script patch. I will also refer to affected and vulnerable during this presentation. So I want to make clear what I'm talking about. Affected means a given vulnerability applies to a system. Vulnerable means the system is affected by vulnerability, but also not secure and might need a security patch as a fix. After a fix is in place, the system is not vulnerable anymore. Finally, a transient speculative execution methods. Exploit microarchitectural side effects of transient executions. Terraform, allowing malicious actor to access information that would generally be prohibited by architectural access control mechanism. As Stefan already mentioned it, Spectre and Meltdown Checker is a widely used open source hardware vulnerability checker tool. My journey with the script started almost two years ago. So far, I have built scripts patches for MDS, TAA, and hence IBRS and SRBDS. You might ask, why do I contribute to the script? Well, that's a very good question. There are several reasons. First and foremost, the script gained on popularity over time. More and more Intel internal and external customers use the script to quickly check the status of the system. Moreover, our team builds and upstream kernel updates that enable Intel hardware mitigations from OS. Therefore, I'm able to have an early access to the kernel fix and microcode before its actual release. What is more, new script patches are complex. I will show more details later. Given the type of work I do, it's given me the opportunity to have a clear understanding of how to detect the status of any given vulnerability and implement this on the script. Since the script is growing in complexity, being already familiar with it helps me achieve this task. Also, by being involved in the script, I try to make sure that by disclosure date, the tool is updated so that end user can check the status of the system regarding new vulnerabilities as soon as they know about it. In addition, the script is now part of our mitigation process. Every time there is a new kernel update, changes are incorporated in the checker script. And last but not least, giving back to the community, collaborate with the engineers around the globe and building my expertise 
as an open source contributor. The next point I would like to address is script capabilities. What script does and doesn't do? In updated kernels, there is a vulnerability file inside CSFS file system that shows a human readable vulnerability status to transient execution attacks. The script reads this information from CSFS. However, the script is so much more than just reading output from CSFS file system. Before I go there, let me first explain what script won't do for you. If your system is vulnerable, script won't magically fix it for you. It won't install any extra packages, microcode, or dependencies. Think of the script as a read-only tool. It won't change any parameters or configuration files on your system. Script does it best to establish if your system is vulnerable to speculative execution, but it doesn't guarantee that your system is 100% secure. In contrast, what script does? Firstly, regardless of the kernel and microcode version, script helps verify if your machine is affected by speculative execution vulnerability, and if script has a known CPU security mitigation in place. Moreover, you can use the script in multiple environments, from bare metal through in virtual environment and containers. Now that we know what are script capabilities, let's take a look at installation process. Ideally, you should run the script with admin privileges. If you don't, script does it best to run assessment, but it cannot get access to all available information. If not a root, script will still run, but you will see a warning signals indicating you are not a root. To download the script, you can use any Linux command to transfer data. Git clone will work too. You can use curl command as well, or wget command. Before installing critical files from internet, such files should pass checksum match and identity verification. Next step is to make sure script is executable. cmat command will do the trick. As mentioned earlier, to get the most out of the script, run it as a root. Now that we have good understanding what script does and doesn't for us, how to download and install the tool, let's identify what needs to be done between discovering CVE vulnerability and pushing a script patch. First, we should find out system that is affected by a given vulnerability. Set of CPUs will vary depending on the vulnerability. List of affected CPUs is available at the main kernel website. Next, after understanding what a given kernel update does, develop a script patch. When the patch is ready, go through rigorous test cycles to check. If system doesn't crash when script is running, it's actually happened to us before, logic was incorrectly set. First, it was written to new MSR, and then it was checking if that MSR exists. It was crashing because it was trying to update non-existing MSR. Another question. Does script do what it's supposed to, to do after you enable and disable kernel update? Does script correctly show output on affected and unaffected systems? Does SysFS output corresponds to script behavior? After changing kernel security mitigation parameters like MDS equal off, does status of the script reflect that? In the output, it is correct in all possible scenarios that include bare metal, virtualization, etc. As a result of this validation, we might need to debug the patch more debugging on the next slide. While debugging is done, 
peer review is equally important to catch and the last new issues. After all is done, we are ready to release script patch to the open source community. As mentioned earlier, script partially relies on the output of the vulnerability file in SysFS. You can check it by running the first command. Besides checking CPU vulnerabilities, script prints and check many other things. For example, it will tell you if you need update kernel or microcode, which hardware flags are enabled, if you are using most current version of microcode. It will check your kernel version, CPU ID, read MSR. It will also parse CPU details. You can also check kernel without actually running it. That's why script has an offline mode that allows to inspect a non-running kernel. This mode is automatically enabled when you specify location of the kernel file, config file, and system map files. Live mode, which is currently running kernel, is a default configuration. If you need to debug script, then use dash v twice as a parameter showed on the slide. The main difference between relying solely on the output of vulnerability file and script is that older systems with older kernels might not have system files at all. Also, CPU security patch, it's usually backported, but not to all of the prior kernels. Therefore, you might have a situation where you have a SysFS file, but no information about specific vulnerability you are interested in. Spectre and Meltdown script solves all of those issues as it checks not only SysFS, but also MSR and many other things. I mentioned it earlier, script patch is complicated. Let me show you how complicated. This slide and the next few, I will be focusing on recent CPU vulnerability called SRBDS, also known as Special Register Buffer Data Sampling. Provided for child, we will break into details on the next few slides. Just bear with me. A full PDF will be available at the conference site itself. When writing a script patch, you want to make sure to identify a list of affected CPUs. Full list is available at the first link here on the bottom, number one. In this example, you can see which Intel processor are affected by SRBDS. Most of them are family six, but it's not full list. So the first step is to convert this into code. For this case, I needed to create a list of affected processors as shown in this image. You can see how the code checks for the CPU family and models of my CPU and compares it against the list in the form of set of if statement, which is here, the top. For SRBDS, having the list of affected processors wasn't enough. There was one caveat described in this second link. That's the caveat in yellow, and on the bottom is the full description. For the case of Kaby Lake L and Kaby Lake systems, I had to check the stepping of the CPU and then check some of the capabilities of the system, MDS and TSX to be precise. Only those Kaby Lake and Kaby Lake L systems of particular stepping that also have TSX enabled might be affected by this vulnerability. In the code, this is a set of if statements where I check for the CPU model stepping and some of the capabilities of the current CPU, which is this section here. Along with the microcode update, Intel added new hardware capabilities that can control mitigation. Script will check presence of specific CPU ID, which is here, when a value of mentioned CPU ID is one, which is here. That means there is MSR that controls enabling and disabling SRBDS mitigation. When value is zero, which is here on the bottom, 
that means system doesn't have this sub capabilities and support for enabling and disabling SRBDS doesn't exist. Therefore, system is vulnerable. The new MSR that control enabling and disabling SRBDS is MSR 123H stands for hexadecimal, which is here. If MSR 123 exists on your system, you can enable or disable mitigation by changing the value of that MSR. When value is one, which is here, that means SRBDS mitigation is disabled, which indicates your system is vulnerable. When MSR 123 value is zero, which is here, that means mitigation is enabled and your system has mitigation in place. Therefore, system is not vulnerable to SRBDS. And this is how does it look in the code. First, I read relevant bit from CPU ID. As you can see in the call to the read CPU ID function. This function reads particular bit and compares it with a given value passed to the function, which is this red value here. If it returns zero, which is equivalent to true in bash, in this case, it means that the bit nine had value one. With this, we know if the system has microcode that supports mitigation for this vulnerability. If the bit nine is set to zero, it means there is no microcode. If it's one, the microcode that mitigates the issue is installed in the system. Next, if this bit nine is one, we must read MSR 123 to check status of mitigation. If this MSR is one, it means that the mitigation is enabled. However, if one, the mitigation is disabled, which means system is vulnerable. Script is done. You run it and you realize your system is vulnerable. What do you do? Well, that tricky question, because the answer is complicated. You might need to update microcode or kernel, or you might not be able to do anything as fix for your specific system might not exist. That being said, script will do it best to explain what is wrong and missing, but it won't fix vulnerability. Moreover, you should follow instructions provided by your OS vendor to install microcode updates. Also, there is a user guide available that will help you manually update the microcode. Here, link in pink. Please reach out to me if you have any questions, as I'm the owner of that piece. Lastly, from the OS, you can also change kernel security parameters, such as MDS equal off. Instructions with available configuration are provided here at the green link. Before you make any changes, make sure you understanding trade-offs and implications. And that brings us to the end of our talk. There are a few key points we would like you to remember from the talk. Those are, firstly, Spectre and Meltdown Checker is a read-only bash script that does it best to determine if your system is secure. However, don't jump too quickly to any conclusions. Number two, due to its simplicity and the fact it's open source, script gain on popularity and it's used by many. Number three, it's important to continue contributing to the script as that's the easiest way to check if your system is impacted by the newest vulnerabilities. There are, however, some drawbacks, some of them. Number one, with each mitigation, script grows in size and making it harder to maintain as well as develop advanced features. Number two, code clean and optimization. Some of the code is redundant and list of affected CPUs, it's still hard coded. We can do better than that. And last but not least, the best way to protect your system is keeping it up to date with the newest patches and software. With that in mind, thank you very much for your attention. There will be Q&A later on.
please feel free to reach out to us with any questions.